Welcome to part two of our two-part series on the rise of Islamic State in the Middle East. Last episode we discussed the rise of Islamic extremism in Iraq and the work of Al-Qaeda in Iraq under its leader Al-Zaqawi. Zaqawi's brutal use of violence in jihad was to play an instrumental role in the development of so-called Islamic State. Azakawi was killed in an American bomb attack in 2006, and today on the History Chronicles we will pick up on the story of what happened after him. So let's examine the rise of ISIS. In 2006, Abu Musab al-Zakawi, the man who had once been the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, was killed when a 500-pound American bomb landed on his safe house. The bomb came from a US fighter jet. The US government had long targeted Zakawi for his actions in Iraq, which undermined the US-backed Iraqi regime. In Zakawi's wake, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, an Iraqi, was appointed to lead the organisation by the head of al-Qaeda in Egypt, Abu Ayyab al-Masri. An indigenous Iraqi leader was preferred, as many Iraqis had grown concerned at the number of foreign jihadists in their country. Zarqawi had set the violent tone for the organisation, but it now announced its clear intention to establish an Islamic emirate in Iraq. For many in the newly named Islamic State, the deceased Zarqawi was already regarded as the first emir, or king, of this new country. The new Islamic State was not to materialise just yet, however. 2007-8 2007-8 saw a massive drive by the US government to root out insurgency in Iraq. Thousands more US troops were deployed in the country and Islamic State were driven from Baghdad. Only a fraction of its cells remained, centred around the Iraqi city of Mosul. By early 2008, almost 2,500 Islamic State members had been killed out of a membership of 15,000. But Washington and the US-backed government in Iraq had grown overconfident in this short-lived victory. In 2008, the US-backed Iraqi government in Baghdad passed the Status of Forces Agreement, giving a timeline for the withdrawal of US forces. All American combat forces would be gone from Iraq by 2011. For the embryonic Islamic State, the Status of Forces Agreement must have been a clear invitation to reignite their campaign across Iraq. A series of attacks rocked the Iraqi capital of Baghdad in August 2009, shortly after the US government had formally handed over control of Baghdad's Green Zone. The Iraqi government, led by Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki, who had been appointed by US forces, had also grown overconfident. So unconcerned was this new leadership with sectarian attacks that they had in fact removed some of the blast walls and other defences from the Green Zone. Two large truck bombs hit the ministries of foreign affairs and finance there, killing 122 people. It is arguable that Prime Minister al-Maliki himself exacerbated the backlash against his government that was to come. Al-Maliki began to govern in an increasingly autocratic fashion, inviting comparisons among his people to the deceased Saddam Hussein. His policies sought out and persecuted those who had been involved in Saddam Hussein's regime, making him even more enemies. $100 $100 billion given to Iraq by the USA in aid appeared to make little difference under a regime that displayed a clear lack of accountability and corruption. In this vacuum of chaos, the Islamic State of Iraq had a renewed base of support and reignited their campaign of violence across the country. The Americans' final withdrawal from Iraq in 2011 appeared to seal the deal. In 2012, the number of Iraqi citizens that died from violent deaths reached over 4,000. In 2013, this had doubled to almost 8,000. The sectarians whom Saddam Hussein had kept violently under control now dominated the country. The Iraqi government under al-Maliki indeed tried to oppose the rise in extremism, but lacking US military support, this only served to make al-Maliki more enemies. To make things worse, al-Maliki was a member of the Shia community, the very group that those involved in Islamic State had targeted from its inception. A group of Sunni protesters against the government in the town of Hawija were brutally suppressed by the Iraqi Shia-led government in 2013, only for Islamic State to overrun the town the following year with the help of local, now sympathetic, tribesmen. Events outside of Iraq now also began to work in favour of Islamic State. Osama bin Laden was found and killed in an American raid in May 2011. He was replaced as a leader of Al-Qaeda by the less charismatic al-Zawahiri, By now, however, the preaching of bin Laden, generally opposing Israel and promoting the Palestinian cause, seemed far less relevant. 
Global News was now attending to the Arab Spring, a series of protests across the Arab world that challenged the power of a generation of dictators, predominantly in Tunisia, Egypt and Syria. It is interesting that bin Laden and Zawahiri had almost nothing to say on these uprisings. Even the fall of President Hosni Mubarak in Egypt provoked no immediate reaction from the leaders of Al-Qaeda. In contrast, the Islamic State of Iraq wasted no time in criticising the secular nature of these uprisings, warning against the so-called un-Islamic ideologies that could replace toppled regimes. Also by 2011, the leadership of Islamic State had changed again. Following the death of Abu Omar al-Baghdadi to an American rocket, a retiring religious scholar, also an Iraqi, took over the organisation of the Islamic State of Iraq. This man was Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. According to interview reports, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi came across with a charismatic but also menacing personality, someone whose name would soon become synonymous with the brutal methods of Islamic State. He had faced internment by US forces in Camp Bukha in Iraq for two years from 2004 to 6. Upon his release, he informed the American guards on the gate that he would be seeing them again, either here or in New York. In 2006, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi joined the Islamic State of Iraq and quickly became known for his ability to organise and deploy jihadists on the battlefield. He was confrontational with his forces, but also not afraid to retreat if conditions were not beneficial. As a result, he was popular among the leadership of Islamic State and, upon the death of Omar al-Baghdadi, only two members of the leading council did not approve Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's elevation to be the new emir. Al-Baghdadi was also one to harbour a grudge. One of the men that voted against him was murdered shortly afterwards. Just as al-Baghdadi became the new leader or emir of Islamic State, events in Syria were to also take a turn for the worse. Protest against the Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad was met with force by the Syrian regime, leading to the outbreak of a full-blown rebellion in the country. This rebellion included secular elements, but also featured large numbers of religious extremists who sought to carve their own interests into the Syrian future. Al-Qaeda announced its arrival into the Syrian conflict with two suicide bombings in Damascus in 2011. Al-Qaeda's head, al-Zawahiri, followed this up by posting a video online that encouraged jihadists from neighbouring Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon and Iraq to join in the fight. Several religious factions emerged as groups that fought against the Syrian regime. Many fighters turned to religious extremism and away from the secular alternative, the Free Syrian Army. This was partly due to the fact that the Free Syrian Army's government existed mainly in exile and was discredited through limited action on the ground in Syria. The Islamic State of Iraq under al-Baghdadi now also expanded its operations into Syria in 2013. In the statement of the 8th of April 2013, Islamic State's leader al-Baghdadi announced the formation of the Islamic State of Iraq and Ashams, meaning the countries of the Levant. ISIS was born. This announcement also marked a formal break in relations with some of the other extremist factions of Islam, in particular the largest Islamic extremist group, al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's leader, al-Zawahiri, had ordered that al-Baghdadi restrict his operations to Iraq. Instead, al-Baghdadi's fighters simply expelled those sympathetic to al-Zawahiri in the east of Syria, killing hundreds of their opponents and thousands of civilians in the process. As a result, al-Baghdadi gained control of the rich oil fields of eastern Syria, giving him the financial resources to not rely solely on wealthy Arab donors from abroad. By the beginning of 2014, Al-Qaeda formally broke its relations with the so-called Islamic State. But more controversy was to come. At the beginning of Ramadan in 2014, al-Baghdadi announced from the Grand Mosque of Mosul that he was now Caliph, in other words, the supreme leader of the Sunni Muslim community. Why was this controversial? Well, another Caliph already existed who was recognised by al-Qaeda. This was Mullah Omar, the founder of the Taliban in Pakistan. On the ground in Syria and Iraq, however, al-Baghdadi's announcement must have appeared to be far more grounded in reality. At the time of the announcement, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant controlled one-third of Syria and 40% of Iraq. In the same year, an ISIS media outlet had released a slick video entitled The End of sykes Pico, a rallying cry that challenged the boundary between Iraq and Syria established by the British and French in 1916 and such videos as these were just one component of al-Baghdadi's campaign for attention from the world's media. 
ISIS used social media platforms to spread footage of the extreme violence prosecuted by their soldiers. Hundreds of images and videos of beheadings, massacres and public executions were spread online. For his sympathisers, al-Baghdadi's reputation as a learned scholar of Sharia law and the Quran appeared to lend him more credibility in terms of the harsh justice that was meted out by ISIS. It is clear that, by 2013, al-Baghdadi had won many admirers across the Muslim world. Polls conducted in Saudi Arabia in this period suggest that 92% of Saudis approved of him. His own proclamation as caliph in 2014 was streamed the following day and went viral on Twitter. Unlike Osama bin Laden, al-Baghdadi eschewed set pieces that were regularly put out on standard media platforms. Instead, he appeared in broadcasts only infrequently, his proclamation as caliph being a rare appearance. This served to only add to his mystique as ISIS's leader. Al-Baghdadi also led ISIS to gain significant military successes. In 2013, an assault on Abu Ghraib prison near Baghdad was a spectacular coup in the face of the Iraqi government. This was the prison where key jihadists and member of Al-Qaeda's leadership were held, and was also the location where American soldiers were filmed abusing captured Iraqis. ISIS's prison break here saw the release of 500 jihadists, many of whom immediately filled the ranks of ISIS. In another move, ISIS fought the Syrian government for control of Minag Air Base to the northwest of Aleppo, also in 2013. This was to prevent the Syrian Air Force from dropping barrel bombs on not just ISIS soldiers, but also the citizens of Aleppo, gaining the movement more sympathy. At the same time, in September 2013, ISIS captured the town of Azaz from the Free Syrian Army. This was a key transit point for foreign fighters from Turkey into Syria, and would aid the steady flow of jihadists into the ranks of ISIS's growing army. As ISIS continued to make similar land grabs in 2013, taking much of Anbar province and the city of Fallujah, its danger continued to be overlooked by the US regime. In Mosul, ISIS fighters even reported surprise at the ease with which they took the city from Iraqi government soldiers. ISIS men were to use the capture of Mosul to loot its bank for half a billion dollars and then hold 48 staff at the Turkish embassy hostage. ISIS's control of the city resulted in an exodus of half a million of its population, which included a large Christian minority. Through the year 2014, ISIS continued to sweep through Iraq. It captured Iraq's largest oil refinery in June of that year, gaining 400 defecting Iraqi soldiers in this campaign. Later that month, Saddam Hussein's former chemical weapons facility also fell to ISIS, giving credits to later reports that ISIS soldiers employed chlorine gas in their attacks. As they advanced, captured Iraqi soldiers were publicly beheaded by ISIS, as were their more traditional enemies, the Shia. When ISIS soldiers captured Badush prison in Mosul, they held a mass execution of its Shia inmates, numbering 670 men. One and a half thousand Iraqi soldiers were executed in just three days as ISIS gained control of an Iraqi government military camp. In Syria, a division of the Syrian army was captured near Raqqa. Of these soldiers, many had their heads cut off and displayed on stakes. Each of these gruesome attacks was recorded and placed online via ISIS's media arm, Al Hayat, attracting yet more attention to the group. By the summer of 2014, the CIA produced an assessment of ISIS's threat that still appeared to underplay the popularity and numbers of the jihadi group. It was estimated that ISIS had 7 to 10,000 soldiers, whereas other reports suggested far, far more. The previous year, President Obama had dismissed ISIS as junior varsity players. After the failings and cost of the Iraq war, Western desire to intervene in the Middle East was now at a low ebb. By this time, however, the United Nations estimated that nearly 2,000 people had fallen victim to ISIS's brutality, over half of which were civilians. August of 2014, though, was to bring one attack which was to wake the West up in terms of the threat that ISIS posed in the Middle East. ISIS soldiers now marched into the territory of the Yazidi community in the Iraqi province of Sinjar. The Yazidis are a Kurdish-speaking group who practice a traditional form of monotheism which is not Islam. The arrival of ISIS, with its demand that the Yazidis embrace Islam or die, therefore resulted in significant brutality. Around 500 Yazidi women and girls were abducted, possibly to be sold as slaves. Other women and children were buried alive outside of their homes. Those that fled, 40,000 of them, sought refuge in the freezing cold Sinjar Mountains, where many died of hypothermia and dehydration. 
The tragic scenes were shown worldwide as Yazidis fled for their lives in the face of ISIS attack. Further outrage at ISIS's actions were triggered by their capture and execution of James Foley, an American journalist. James Foley was executed in an orange jumpsuit, the same uniform worn by those interred in the USA's infamous prison Guantanamo Bay. ISIS's message was clearly laid out. An email to James's parents sent by ISIS, which they made public, even stated that we will not stop until we quench our thirst for your blood. The execution of another American, Stephen Sotloff, gained further attention with the fact that his executioner appeared on screen with a British accent. This man, who came to be known as Jihadi John in some British newspapers, brought the message even closer to home that ISIS had attracted fighters from all over the world. But despite the outrage in the world's media, little was done to keep ISIS in check. President Obama continued to hesitate through 2014. A vote in the House of Commons in Britain put a stop to any military intervention on the ground by the UK government. By late September, a US-led coalition of 40 countries was formed, but this still had reached no clear consensus on what was to be done about Islamic State. ISIS was eventually to fail, but it was to keep hold of its conquests throughout much of the 2010s, only losing significant territory in 2019. Its downfall eventually came due to combat operations led by Kurdish Peshmerga fighters and Shia militias supported by Iran, along with air support from a US-led coalition of 74 other countries. But in 2014, ISIS had reached the height of its power. According to some reports, it commanded almost 200,000 soldiers at this time across the Middle East, and it expanded its operations into North and West Africa. By 2015, it had also gained a military presence in Afghanistan and Yemen. We have therefore now seen the lethal concoction behind the rise of ISIS in its later stages. Western inaction, chaotic civil war in Syria and Iraq, al-Baghdadi's leadership and ISIS's methods of publicity, along with its brutal methods of violence, all gave rise to a movement that made rapid military gains, and proved to be immensely popular as hundreds of foreign fighters flocked to join its ranks. ISIS had emerged from the ruins of Iraq, had grown up in the shadow of al-Qaeda, and had then set off on its own violent path towards jihad. In so doing, it had demonstrated a new approach to religious warfare through viral online posts of its most brutal activities. Its leader, al-Baghdadi, had exploited every opportunity to prosecute jihad in Iraq and then in Syria, taking the movement away from its roots in al-Qaeda. His religious credentials and regional alliances crafted a movement whose fast expansion took the Western world by surprise and rocked the very foundations of the modern Middle East. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of the History Chronicles. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do like, subscribe, support our channel on Patreon if you can, leave a comment if you're interested in this topic, and please, please do join us again for another episode for some more history. <laughs>